Vintage music from the Stonebriar Community Church. So glad to have all of you here to listen and to sing along with us as we join our voices in praise to God. Don will lead us in a few moments, but before, it's a good time for us to get a little bit better acquainted with one another. We're unable to see you who are visiting with us online. Thank you for joining us. Always glad to have you and to know that you were there. It's a special reminder that we reach beyond our own borders here and reach out to all of you. Thank you for your presence and your prayers and your support. And thanks to you who visit today in our service. We're so happy to have you and please that you would come and visit with us. We want you to know you're welcome anytime you wish to be here. To show you our warmth and uh, desire that you feel that sense of uh, uh, presence with one another, let's uh, reach out to each other for a few moments. Just stand up wherever you're sitting and, and reach across to say hello to someone as you introduce yourself. Good. Thank you. Thank you.
Our friend Christian has a word for us on the screens today regarding something that you need to know about. So let's listen together as we watch the screens together. Making plans for the summer? Hey, so are we. I'm Christian Diaz from Family Ministries, and I'm here to give you a little preview of what's coming up this summer at Stonebriar. First, it's not summer without summer camp. So if you have kids or grandkids in first through 12th grade, it's almost time for them to sign up. This June, our middle schoolers will head to Camp Copas in Denton, and our high schoolers will venture out to Glorieta, New Mexico. Both camps will give students a chance to grow closer to God, build meaningful friendships, and have unforgettable adventures together. Then June 24th through 28th, kids are invited to our elementary day camp right here at Stonebriar for all kinds of hands-on activities like water games, crafts, Bible stories, cooking, and so much more. And grown-ups, we have some pretty exciting elementary camp volunteer opportunities if you want to be part of the fun. Beyond camps, we've got activities for kids like open play days and Monday fun days all summer long. And that's not all. We have events and service opportunities for all ages, like our go trips to Kenya and Poland, our summer lunches ministry for local families in need, some special concerts from our music ministry, and you know what? It's too much to sum up. Check out all the details for yourself at stonebriar.org slash summer, and let's dive into the best summer yet. The details of this worship service were solidified about three months ago, and I have been looking forward to this service for the last three months. In my heart, I just know this is going to be a great time of worship. Thank you for being here. I've, I'm looking forward to hearing the orchestra play, the choir sing, and looking forward to our worshiping together. Psalm 95, the psalmist uses plural pronouns when he says this, come, let us worship the Lord. Let us kneel before him. Let us bow before him in worship. There's just something wonderful and special about community worship, corporate worship. We all worship the Lord uh, individually, uh, alone during the week, driving along in our cars, sitting out under a tree. But something happens when we gather together in his name to give him praise. Psalm 150 is the last psalm in our book of Psalms. It was written by David. And in it, he talks about, a, he describes a worship service. And he says this, in a corporate worship service, it's nice to have trumpets and brass. It's nice to have a harp playing. It's nice to have uh, drums, and percussion. And we have all of that this morning in our, our wonderful orchestra. And the choir, as a call to worship, is going to sing the lyrics, the text of Psalm 150.
of these words are spoken and sung from the deep recesses of our hearts. We do acknowledge you as the Lord of all. In the best way we know how, we submit our lives to you. Lord, things that have taken place in our past, things that are going on in the present and our future, we place in your hands. We have faith and trust and confidence in you. We give you great praise this morning. We pray in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. There are few more unenviable tasks than following greatness. Some of you have found yourself in that situation as you have been called to step in and fill large shoes, feeling at the time it's virtually impossible to do this. Nevertheless, that is the calling that you received and you have given it your best. We come upon a scene like that in Joshua chapter one. Having watched the giant Moses lead the people of the Hebrews out of the iron gates of Egypt, freeing them from slavery, taking them through the wilderness all the way to the edge of the land of Canaan called in scripture the promised land. And then, without further announcement, God escorts him up the mountain, Mount Nebo, all the way to the heights of Pisgah, at the crest of the mountain, and, and there Moses dies, and God privately buries him. No one knows to this day where that burial site is. But back down the mountain, there was a task to be completed. The Hebrews need to move into Canaan. And Moses is gone. So Joshua must follow the giant. And in doing so, he must walk carefully with his God that he might do that well. We read of it in Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9. You have your Bible with you, quite likely, and if you do, turn to the first chapter of Joshua, just beyond the book of Deuteronomy, and follow along as I read for you this account of nine verses where we hear of God's passing the torch 
from, from Moses to his attendant named Joshua. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You follow along in the version that you use. Stand with me, please, out of respect for the Word of God. And listen carefully. Try to imagine hearing these words and knowing that you have the responsibility of stepping in. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead the people. the Israelites across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Then he gives the boundaries from the Negev wilderness in the south up to the Lebanon mountains to the north. From the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. So be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I have given to their successors. I swore to their successors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instruction Moses gave you. Do not, do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Please bow with me. Our Father, we enter this building today you know, from many walks of life, but all come with their own set of circumstances. 
some of them on the heights of excitement, encouragement, others discouraged, disappointed, a bit confused, disturbed over our times and, and, and struggling to figure out what exactly are you doing? We wonder about that as we look across the landscape of our culture and, 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 we, and we see the chaos. We see the, uh, the uh, negative spirit. We see even warfare and, and uh, the, the, the threat of the loss of life. Our hearts go out, for example, to the people of Israel. We pray for their, their ongoing peace, which they now miss, they lack. Only you can bring it. Please bring it. Please give them reassurance. Help them as they recover from the assault of months ago, bring back those who have been held hostage. Bring hope and reassurance to those who await them with open arms. In our own land, there are needs, great needs, great needs, which only you can meet. We need you, our Father, to be the one who guides our country by providing wise counsel to those in leadership, by overruling foolish decisions and wrong choices. Have your way, Lord. There are heartbreaks in homes and there are struggles in relationships, only you can bring harmony and relief and hope. Please do that. We rely on you for that. Thank you for our church. We do not take this for granted, the beautiful music, the harmony of our fellowship, the delight of those engaged in activities that have eternal dimensions, the ministry of those who go beyond our own borders here and reach out to those in other lands, other cultures, watch over them, give safety, success, encouragement. Use our gifts for those purposes, for we give them Confident, confidently that you will use these gifts in the lives of those who need them the most. Commit to you the balance of our time. May the instruction of this morning hit home. May we not leave the same way we entered this building. Speak to us not only collectively as a group, but individually as we apply what we hear to our lives and the way we live them. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Giants have roamed across this old earth ever since God created men and women. By giants, I'm not referring to the uh, large-sized humans, but those who live lives of greatness. Giant-like accomplishing individuals. People greatly admired for their achievements, their commitments, their solid work done often before the public and even more often behind the scenes. They're great whether we are aware of the greatness at the time or not. They prove themselves giant-like in character. Or as Winston Churchill referred to them, in character. They just stand alone. But they're mere mortals. They're, they all finally pass. I think it was Arnold Toynbee who said the, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one dies. They all fade away. They all die. Some of them leaving unfillable holes. And when we stop to think about examples, we agree there just is no one that can truly take their place. Who could step in for our 16th president after he was assassinated? Who was qualified to take the place of five-star General Douglas MacArthur after leading us into victory in the Pacific Theater of the Second World War and then pouring into the life of the Emperor of Japan to bring that country back to dignity and life and prosperity in the future. After Truman relieved him of his command, who stepped in? Who was Martin Luther's appointment after his departure? Not even Philip Melanchthon, as good a friend as he was, would ever have considered himself the replacement. In fact, it's rare to find any of the Protestant reformers having someone follow in their train. Giant-like men. Hopefully you were, you, you were blessed to have some in your life. I certainly was. And to this day, I give thanks for each one. Matter of fact, I'm sitting in my study, turning the lights down before leaving late one evening this past week, and I, I began to review greatness across just this land of ours. Beginning up in the Boston area, Park Street Church, coming down across the Midwest with Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey, and coming to Nebraska where Warren Wiersbe lived and carried out his writing ministry and his books remain in, on the shelves of all serious students of the scriptures. I found myself traveling up to the Northwest and remembering Earl Rodmacher at Western Seminary, coming down to 
John G. Mitchell at Multnomah School of Bible, Ray Stedman at Palo Alto Peninsula Bible Church, J. Vernon McGee, Church of the Open Door, across the Southwest and into Texas where I studied. And, and I, I remember the, the, the pastor, W.A. Criswell, now gone, but some of you having the privilege of being ministered to by that giant who stood strong and firm and tall and sometime alone. I stopped at the school where I'd spent four years and gave thanks for one giant after another, each one of whom is now dead. I remember sitting in the classroom not wanting to leave, drinking in what was taught, learning truth to live by, to minister with, to embrace personally, truth that would help me be a, 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 a better husband, a better minister, a, a, a more competent expositor. All the while, examples of remarkable brilliance, yet amazing humility. Now all gone, except in my mind. I still have the notes. Back in those days, there were no computers. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and I have handwritten notes. Thoughts disentangle themselves over the lips and through the fingertips. And as I disentangled my thoughts while listening to the giants, I remember bearing down hard on certain subjects, certain warnings, certain reminders. I could name for you 12, 15, 20 giants who formed the faculty of Dallas Seminary in my era of 59 through 63. And as I said in my study, I gave thanks for each one. I moved across the South and came down to a little Florida Bible college that trained so many in evangelism, teaching them to love the Lord God to walk with him, to serve him faithfully, and so many other schools along the way. You run out of time before you run out of examples. Each school, including giants, whose shoes must be filled. Maybe you played ball for one of those great coaches who understood the game and was a real strategist, but more importantly, understood players and was fair and disciplined. Amazing championship teams were turned out by such individuals. I will never forget sitting next to Tom Landry on the board on Dallas Theological Seminary's Board of Incorporate Members and, and just listening to the giant. I realized, honestly, I, I've never been a Cowboy fan. I've been a Tom Landry fan because I, I love greatness of life. Someone who couldn't bear having someone on the team that did drugs at the same time he wore the uniform. Or maybe you played in an orchestra under a conductor who distinguished herself or himself and, and, and you'll never be the same because of what they taught you. 
And I haven't even taken the time to mention inventors and artists and others, giants all. And that brings us back to the biblical giants. Moses was one. For 40 of his final years, from age 80, count them, to 120, the man leaves Egypt, having led his father-in-law's sheep in the, in the desert, he came to Egypt and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe against Pharaoh and dared him not to let the people go. Pharaoh resisted and in came the plagues. One, two, three, four, all the way to ten till finally the firstborn death. And Pharaoh says, get those people out of here. And Moses went from sheep to some students would say as many as two million people pouring out of the gates of Egypt into the wilderness. Can you imagine the task? I mean, we read it and it's uh, unfortunately because of familiarity, it's ho-hum. But he led these people through the untrackable land along Sinai and the blistering sands of the desert. Cloud by day, fire by night, manna to keep them from starving, water from the rock. They even came upon the, the Red Sea and and there was no way to cross and in the distance were the Egyptian soldiers with their chariots moving quickly toward them to bring them back into slavery. And Moses has the audacity to say to all the people, the one thing they didn't expect, stand still. Watch the deliverance of the Lord. Those are the words of a giant. Don't panic. Don't worry. Don't look for rocks to throw at them. The Lord will fight for you. And the sea opened and they walked across dry land and in came the Egyptians and the seas returned. Can you imagine talking with Joshua that night as Moses says to Joshua, you know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. <laughs> See, he had never read Exodus 12, 13, 14. You have so often you yawn. Not Joshua. He's sitting under candlelight or torch in the tent and he looks into the face of aging Moses thinking, I'm so glad you were there to lead us. And Moses sharing with Joshua other events Later came the snakes. Remember the snakes? Where the people were grousing about how hot it was and how uncomfortable it was and there was no variety of food, just this gag me manna that keeps coming like snow. I mean, Mrs. Moses' cookbook on how to fix manna must have been 12 inches thick. But it sustained them. 
And Joshua gave thanks year after year, year after year. And then one day, one day without announcement, God said to Moses, come here, up the mountain. Maybe before anyone rose from sleep, he took him up to Mount Nebo and got him to Pisgah, the heights, and, and privately buried Moses. Part of the reason was there's not to be a shrine built to Moses. Life goes on beyond Moses. No memorials. No Mecca. And then God comes and says to young Joshua or younger Joshua, right out of a shoot, Moses, my servant is dead. Twice he says it, lest there be any misunderstanding. You, Joshua, now follow the giant. You're on. What a task. Let me add here a principle that I hope you never forget, ever, throughout your life. When a man of God dies, nothing of God dies. When a man of God or a woman of God fades away, nothing of God fades away. Each comes for a season serves the generation that God's chosen, and then he or she is removed. God isn't into cloning. Another different kind of leader comes. Equally committed, but doesn't have the stature that the predecessor had, so that takes time. So God faithfully stays, prepares, in the process of time, it is amazing. Honestly, you, while you revere the one that was there before, you, you, you can hardly remember what it was like. By the time Warren Sandy was well underway with the navigators, who kept referring to his predecessor, Dawson Trotman? Dawson Trotman died, drowned in the lake, Scroon Lake, age 50. Age. And the mantle fell on Sandy. Bill Bright gone. Steve Douglas arrives. On and on we could go. Shoes must be filled. Steps must be taken to press on the ministry, and sometime even with, with great missionaries. You find yourself hard-pressed to know who could ever take their place. Maybe no one, so someone altogether different leads that kind of ministry in a new direction. With God is in it, there's everything right about it. If people will remember, we're not here to compare. We're here to trust God and move on. Uh, 
Charles Haddon Spurgeon at the Tabernacle in London. You can't name the one who took his place. And yet he dies before he turns 60, a couple of years before then. Oh, there were others that came, but never was there another Spurgeon. Let it be. When a man of God dies, nothing of God dies. When a man or woman of God fades away, nothing of God fades. Press on. Press on. And so the Lord pulls aside Joshua and says, Moses is gone. Don't make a journey up the mountain. You won't find the burial site. This is not about Moses' burial. This is about your beginning. Go with it. Could have chosen Caleb, couldn't he? Caleb was equally qualified. But he didn't. And you know what's beautiful? Not one word of envy from Caleb because God chose Joshua. I love that. Caleb wasn't the envying type. He was too busy taking the mountain where the other literal giants lived. He had work to do. And so if you were called to follow a giant, and you certainly will not do so as a quick little volunteer. You will have to be convinced that God's in it. Step up. When God is in it, he gives all that's needed to carry on the ministry. Just make sure that you understand when, when, when God relieves an individual, he brings his replacement. Stay out of the way. Be careful about getting too hard and fast with your expectation. We don't need your expectation. We need God's approval. When God approves and God provides as he did with Joshua. You have to look hard and long to find something in Joshua's life that ever went wrong. He was a good choice, but he was not Moses. He was never called to be a Moses the second. There was only one giant. And then Joshua came and on his own became his own type of giant as a leader. And so, when you read the account in Joshua 1, 1 to 9, including verse 18, the last verse of the chapter, four times you will hear the same command. Be strong and courageous. Strength is what you do, courage is what you are. You'll need strength when you move in where the Canaan, Canaanites have lived. You'll live in houses they once built. You'll have to deal with the, with the gods that they have put in their, in their uh, houses. Uh, historical records as well as architectural findings reveal that most likely pornography got its start in Canaan. Be strong and courageous. Get rid of that filth. Get it out of the Hebrew's eyes. Strong and courageous. I was reading the passage to Cynthia this past week, and I said, that's the way we, we, we got to live. So in the morning, we're going to wake up strong and courageous. 
go to bed at night. We're going to go to bed strong and courageous. So I got up this morning, and both of us kind of sliding around to try to find the coffee pot. And I said, we're going to be strong and courageous. I didn't quite have it in my, in my mouth the right way. And she goes, strong and courageous. Yeah, that's right, strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. What a way to live. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to, you're going to drink from cisterns you didn't dig. You're going to enjoy the, the fruit of the vine that you didn't plant. You're going to eat from trees that you didn't nurture. And then he adds, be careful. Careful. You're going to get fat and sassy and before long. You're not going to drive out all those Canaanites. And you must. Canaanites, Jebusites, Hittites, termites, all of them. Get them out. Get them out. Strong and courageous. Don't back away. He rolled up his sleeves, and even though he did not have a team of warriors among them, they're bricklayers. They're stonemasons. They're brick makers in Egypt all those years. So the Lord said, I'll give you the land. You get to Jericho, you're going to see those walls. Don't be intimidated. Those walls will fall my way. Walk around the wall once every day for seven days. The seventh day, walk around seven times. And then yell. <laughs> How's that for a strategy? But stand back because they're Stones are going to hit you when the walls fall. Yeah, right. <laughs> they fell. Of course they fell. Because when a man of God dies, nothing of God dies. Look at that. You and I will find when we walk with and talk with giants, it begins to rub off. And we start thinking like giants. We start trusting like giants. We start believing like giants. And we need to do that. God's plan is, is a, a continuum of individuals. And some of them are surprising. Let it be. Each one God brings along, he will bring with him certain truths that you will learn from them, which brings me to the very important subject. Joshua is told by the Lord in verses 1 to 9, there are two sources of truth that you're to spend your time pondering, applying, and living out. First, the instructions of Moses. Remember what Moses taught you. Rehearse in your mind his words. The oral instructions of Moses are invaluable. Rehearse them, pass them along, teach them to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house and you walk by the way and you lie down for the night and get up in the morning. Rehearse them. 
but there's also written truth in his word. Pour over it, meditate on it, chew it like a cow chooses its cud. Digest it, redigest it, rethink it. Giants become that because they make that truth applicable and you love that about them. Every giant that has shaped my life has been a person of the word of God. Everyone. Everyone has had a well-worn Bible. Everyone understood its truths as best they could. Everyone reminded me, hear it, read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it. So in every place where I've ministered, I've heard it, I've read it, I've studied it, I've memorized it, and I've meditated on it. All of that becomes the foundation for a solid ministry. It means they don't have to rely on my ideas, but what God has written. How valuable is that? How do you follow a giant? Well, you realize, first of all, that you're in the presence of one when you're there and you begin to take notes, mental notes, written notes, things you repeat to someone else, preferably to begin with your own family. Which brings me ultimately now to a story. I long for time with my father as I was growing up. I've told you my story earlier and, and uh, I, I've not hesitated to, to describe it as it was. My view of our home was very different from my older brother's view and my older sister's view. They were wanted, they were planned. I was neither. But I was born and uh, I was told early on I was a mistake. My brother wasn't brilliant and very capable in everything he touched and my, he was the apple of my mother's eye. My sister was Miss Personality from her earliest years, and my dad was captivated by my sister. I think he would say for her, I was born and became a father. I, I was a mistake. Didn't understand that till we had one of our children. And uh, <laughs> that began to make sense. But my folks didn't hesitate to say it. I'll be brutally honest, I believe, because abortion was back then a criminal act, they chose not to have me aborted, or they would have. My mother did not want three children. And I became for her an interruption, and in many ways, uh, difficult. I wasn't abused, I wasn't starved, certainly not. I wasn't tied up or pushed in a room and locked there, not, not that. I was just ignored. I was involved in school. We had our concerts and our, our ball games and, and uh, 
And my mom and dad went to none of them, not one. Not one. We never missed a recital that my brother played in. We never missed a swim meet my sister participated in. But we were not involved in my activities. Uh, so what do you do? It's impossible to totally turn that off. Could have rebelled and made life miserable for the family. I chose not to do that. that that's silly. That's stupid. But it was hurtful. Now let me get to the bottom line. I long for at least a meaningful conversation with my father. To me, he was giant-like in that he had life pretty well figured out. He was secure and knew who he was and did his work well and was admired by his peers and and loved by my mother. And I longed to tap into uh, what he could pass on to me. Fast forward to uh, beyond my mother's death, and my dad is now living with us. One of the reasons I urged Cynthia to agree that we have my dad come live with us is that we might have a chance to really hear what he has to tell us and as he spends time with our children, his four grandchildren, and, and just maybe that special conversation with me. She, she willingly agreed and was so kind to him and, and helped in the move, and my dad lived there for nine years. Around the end of his eighth year, he's come to church with my sister. He always came with her to the church I pastored in California. And uh, they were sitting at row 17. And I'm preaching. I'm preaching the second of three morning services, and, and we would do two that night. We were doing five services a Sunday while we were building a new building. and. And uh, so it was a it was a get at it time and not a lot of extra hours and I was busy and other things and I still had this longing I still lived for the day he would say Hey Charles come here sit down hadn't happened so I'm preaching. And I suddenly see my father twist, his face twists, and I know something is wrong. My sister almost stood up and stayed seated and looked up at me around the head of the person in front of her like, what do I do? My dad had two or three strokes at the moment and then a heart attack. His forehead hit the pew in front of them. You could hear it. <clears throat> uh, a few people turned and I saw it and I thought, okay, what do I do? I, I didn't know what to do. So my dad passed out. Soon the paramedics come and Piece him on a gurney and roll him out into the narthex, and I'm watching through the glass of the back doors as they are pumping on his chest to bring him back. All the while I'm preaching. Not sure what I said, but I was preaching. The reason I went on is there were, we had four television rooms that were full. And the church was full and the balcony was full and, and all the people from row 16 up did not know anything was happening. And I thought, why would I stop 
and uh, call attention to that and end the service abruptly. And so I chose not to, whether it's the right call or not, I don't know. Uh, after they had worked with him out there, the head usher, Ken Meberg, walked inside the back door and gave me the sign like, we got him, he's back. But he would never be the same, ever. He would never finish a sentence. He would never swallow that well. The, the uh, stroke uh, affected the nerves on the side of his neck and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even get one little pill down him uh, for the next year. We weren't able to care for him as we needed to. We needed medical assistance and we moved him into a memory center, a very fine place there in the city where we lived and I would visit with him and, and uh, I remember like almost like a little boy. I was in my, uh, it would be my late 40s and I realized my dad had never really spent time with his grandchildren and we had never had any kind of talk and I would sit by the bed and Maybe, maybe there'd be a moment where we'd be lucid enough to talk. And I told him repeatedly that I loved him and he would fade and come back. And about a year later, I closed his eyelids and pulled the sheet up over his head at the hospital and kissed him goodbye. And we never had our talk. <laughs> Whatever it may have been, he would have wanted to say to me. I sometimes dream of the possibility of that talk. never happened. And uh, I, I do wonder if Joshua must have had on occasion, oh, wish I had one last talk with Moses, just one last time. I'd love to ask him about this whole thing in AI that happened and I'd like to get his insight on the way I handled that or a warning that maybe something could have been done better. But Moses was dead. And gone. Like my dad. Some time ago, I, I made a decision that I'm so grateful God led me to make. I decided that I would uh, mentor two of my grandsons. One is in a little beyond 35 and the other was not quite 30 yet. Neither is married. We meet on Saturday mornings alone. The three of us. Some of the most meaningful times I've ever had with anyone, I'm having with them. Yesterday we, we, we met Saturday morning and going through my book on David, we have come to, on that Saturday, the David Bathsheba story. And our whole two and a half hours were spent on moral purity. I never had one conversation with my father on moral purity. 
I'd love to know how he handled that. So I've decided not to make my grandsons wait to know. I would tell them. And we talked about how a woman can lust just like a man. How the situation with Bathsheba was not a rape. It was consensual sex. And then I looked into their eyes and I said, you two men are so handsome and so competent. A woman doesn't necessarily fall in love with a, with a, you know, handsome build as much as she does with someone that's respected, someone that's competent, and you two men are on your way toward a life of competence. Watch out. Then I told my story from the Marine Corps and how it can be done. You, you, can, you can conquer it. all temptations. I gave them tips on what I do and things that have worked and boy, they are like writing this down. And uh, sometime we would pause and you could hear a pen drop. Then they would ask a question or they would simply sit and look at me. I would tell them, you're going to make terrific husbands and fathers. But for that to happen, you must watch out for the Bathshebas in your life. You'll be like a magnet to them. They will want you. And if you do not have the guardrails in place, you will, like David, fall. And we read this story again. They listened like on the edge of their seat as their granddad told them, talked about it. I thanked them for listening and one of them left, lingered a little with tears and said, I can't thank you enough for this. He said, we, we hear from you what we've never heard from our own dad. Furthermore, we don't respect our dads. Their mothers have remarried and found a wonderful mate in life, but their dads. So they said, we thank you for taking time. I said, when it comes to you, That's my gift for you. Because I don't want to leave this earth and you look at my tombstone and say, we never had that talk. You ask me anything you want to ask me and I'll talk about it with you. If I don't know, I'll say, I don't know. Let's see if we can find the answer to that. Are you mentoring your grandchildren? No, I'm not talking about playing games with them or doing puzzles with them. Or I'm talking about mentoring. Why not? No one means more to them than you do. They long to know what your life has been like. Tell them. Love them. 
you may find that one or two of them don't even know the Lord. And you thought they did. Gives you a chance to lead them to Christ. Lead them. Love them into the life of Christ. They will thank you for the rest of their lives. My dad's body rests under a silent tombstone, which is fitting because my relationship with him was silent. I've determined my relationship with my children and my grandchildren will not be silent. Because I love them. Because I want them to become giants. who walk with God. Father, thank you for helping me this morning say what I feel should have been said. Thank you for bringing giants into my life and giving me surrogate men who've been like dads to me, those who were willing to talk to me and warn me and instruct me and correct me and love me. Thank you for my children and my grandchildren, our grandchildren, our children. May they walk with you. May they love you. May it be a real love, no phony stuff. And may they become, in the years to come, the giants this world needs as they walk with you, talk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for spending your morning with us today. We'd love for you to join us again next week and get connected with our church family. Beyond our worship services, we have groups you can join virtually. And if you're in the North Texas area, we have some summer events coming up that you won't want to miss. So explore ways to connect on campus and online at stonebriar.org welcome.